Today, we, obviously, we're talking about Christmas. We're well into Advent um, this week, next week, and then uh, obviously Christmas Day, we're going to be talking about Jesus. It's one of the things we talk about every week. Uh, we celebrate him coming every week. We celebrate his death and his resurrection and his glorious rule and reign over all of creation every week. Every week we talk about these things because these are the most amazing things, I mean, really, that have ever happened. <clears throat> and not only that, but this is, this is the God of the universe who speaks and billions and billions of stars in billions of galaxies in obedience to his voice come into existence uh, for his glory and displaying his glory and here we are on the edge of the Milky Way, on the edge of the you know, known universe, with this amazing grandstand view of just an aspect of his creative power and his glory. It's really wonderful. Let alone to see in Jesus, in his coming, the love of God really made manif- manifest as he dwells among us. So it's really, I mean, it's, it is a wonderful time of year. And I know we put a heap of pressure on Christmas, so... Um, you ask anybody, any random Australian, what's Christmas about? Some might say, oh, it's about Jesus. Many will say it's about family. It's about food. It's about coming together. It's about, um, you know, celebrating or some will kind of think maybe it's about just gratitude or thankfulness in general. And what can happen is we put a whole heap of pressure and expectation upon Christmas to do something for us for which it was never originally intended. We say it's all about family. We're going to have the whole family together. And then when the family's not together, it's a bad Christmas. Or where there are fractured relationships, it's a sad Christmas. Or where someone in your family has died, it will never, your family will never have that Christmas where they're all together again. I remember, I mean, uh, so many of you know, my brother died uh, when I was 19, he was 16. That was a long time ago. And still, decades later, uh, when I get together with my family, there's, there's something that's, the family's not all there, right? That's not only just, he's not there, but his wife that he never had isn't there, and kids that he never had isn't there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so if we put the expectation upon Christmas to be family, or even food, even if it's just food, you're like, we're going to have a feast, it's going to be amazing, and then the roast gets burnt, or you don't buy an appropriately sized turkey, or you can't get you, only get, you only get fake ham, not real ham, and all of a sudden, again, all the expectation is on this particular thing that Christmas is about, and all of a sudden it can't be about that thing. Do you understand what I'm saying? We put, when we take our ideas of Christmas from Hollywood 40 years ago, 60 years ago, and don't anchor them in the thing that never fails, then we're setting ourselves up, <clears throat> not necessarily for failure, because you might have all your family together. Welcome, you can come on in. Howdy. You're not late. Jacket looks awesome. Uh, I'm so sorry. That was a bad joke and an appropriate response. Um, yeah, so if we, if we are, even if everything goes great, right? We, the food is just perfect. The family's all together. You get that present that you wanted. You've been dropping hints. And wow, they actually caught the hints and got you the thing that you wanted. Still, I put it to you, that is wanting for far less than Christmas promises to give. So here's, here's my contention for today. We'll get into Luke 2 in a minute. That Christmas is, like the angels say, good news of great joy for everybody. Good news Great joy for you. So if, we're, if our expectation of Christmas is going to be awesome food, going to be awesome family, going to be awesome gifts, going to be wonderful weather, and actually looks like pretty good weather in Adelaide, <clears throat> even all of that, if the day circumstantially gives you all of those things, it still it pales in comparison to the true gift that Christmas wants to give. Am I making sense? Am I setting up my argument okay? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? It could be the most wonderful day in your entire life and there's so, so much more to the degree that if the food is terrible and you're, you have no family at Christmas and you get no gifts at Christmas, 
what is on offer at Christmas is so surpassing, so superior to all of those things. Now, I'm not going to say it's not going to hurt, but the joy that's on offer is so, so, so far greater than your circumstance that the satisfaction it promises, the, the fulfilledness or fulfilling it, it promises, it's not a vague hope, it's a sure promise. Well, let me show you how. Luke 2, 10. <clears throat> angels come. Like Beck was alluding to earlier, when we think angels in kind of Australia 2023, uh, outside the church at least, we tend to have this um, idea of a, like a really tall, winged creature, uh, maybe with a halo and uh, perhaps maybe a harp, possibly, something like this. And, and some of those details or images that we do get from Scripture. Uh, but it could be as simple as a messenger to somebody bringing a message from God. And so here we have these messengers sent from God saying to a bunch of shepherds looking after their sheep, ordinary day or ordinary evening at this stage. Boring evening, looking after sheep, out on you know, some hills somewhere in the middle of nowhere, and then, bam, angels appear. And they say, don't be afraid! Because obviously you would be very afraid if you were a shepherd out on a hill somewhere looking after sheep, and all of a sudden, somebody appears. <clears throat> don't be afraid for look, or your version might say, Behold, which sounds much more cool. I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. So whom is it for? Who is it for? It's for everybody. Verse 11, today is Saviour, who is the Messiah, the Lord, meaning the anointed one, was born for you in the city of David. It's good news, great joy, to the degree that you know who Jesus is, and what he's come to do. Good news, great joy for you. So again, this is my contention. This is, my, this is, this is what I want to impress upon you today. Christmas really is about joy. I know that we say it's about joy, and that can become a little bit naff, like, you know, the carols sing, and, and the first time you hear a carol, it might be like, wow, that is an amazing... Those lyrics, are, if they are true, that's phenomenal. But then, you know, it, it's cute because kids sing it, and... Uh, there's the 800th version you've heard playing on coals, uh, you know, after a couple of decades of Christmases, and those words lose their power. And then we start to think, oh, Christmas is about joy, but then we morph our expectations off of the person and work of Jesus and onto family, weather, presents, food, and fun. And we say, yeah, Jesus, we say Christmas is all about joy, but we start to mean these things, whereas. The first people to proclaim what Christmas is about said it is good news. Good, good not as like there's okay news and there's good news and there's great news. Let me good news as in the news you've been waiting for. It's not bad news. It's good news. Great joy. That's, that's, the, that's the qualification. It's not average joy. It's not the joy you get down the road. It is great joy, and it's for you, they say. Oh, sorry, they say it's for everybody. The great joy is for everybody. Savior's been born for you, is what they say. The one we've been waiting for. The long-awaited Jesus. Again, we've got carols about this as well. <clears throat> Who is Jesus? What does it mean for him to be the Messiah? The Lord? Let's keep reading. Here's how some of the people respond to uh, in the same passage, this is how they respond to Jesus, respond to his coming. What does it mean? What does it look like? Why is it so joy bringing? How can this kind of joy be a joy that makes all the other joys so much more sweet and joyful? And even in the absence of all of those other joys, still fill us with joy. This is how the angels respond. Uh, in verse 13, suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly hosts with the angel praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth 
to people he favours. So there's an angel, a messenger, who says, hey guys, don't be afraid. I know I just appeared out of nowhere, this angelic being, but I've got good news, great joy for everybody. I wonder why, do you wonder why I'm telling this to, to, to shepherds? Ah, oh, well, it's good news, great joy for everybody. Saviour's born for you. And then all of a sudden, a great host, hundreds or thousands of other angels, and they all start glorifying God. I start, start praising him, saying that God is amazing. Glory to God in the highest. What he has done today is one of the most remarkable things that will ever happen. When the angels went away from them into heaven, so like, we're, we're going back home. We've told you the good news. We're out of here. The shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste, found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. Man, they, <clears throat> I mean, I, I would have to imagine what it would be like for those shepherds. I'm imagining they're not, they're like the highest educated people. They're not the ones that have gone from city to city seeing great sights or hearing great thoughts necessarily. They, they may have. But all of a sudden they have witnessed something very few people in, in, among all of the billions of people who have lived have experienced. And they live at a time which was one of the most phenomenal moments in history. And, that, and Scripture says, Luke writes, that they made haste. They're like, that is amazing. We've got to go. This changes everything. And so they go and they find Mary and Joseph and a baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they heard and seen as it had been told to them. So again, the shepherds, joy, so angels come, proclaim this good news of great joy. The shepherds make haste and they join the angels in proclaiming and bringing God glory. They're like, we can't hold it in. The angels come, they can't hold it in. I, I, again, I don't know, other than God's providence, why they go to shepherds. Maybe it's the first people they see as they're you know, doing whatever angels do. They see some shepherds, they're like, you wouldn't believe what just happened. And the angels go and they're like, you wouldn't believe what just happened. And all the while they're praising God. They've been waiting for this moment. Since the garden, when God said the seed of the woman is going to come and crush the head of the serpent, God is going to come, dwell among you, make all things new. They've been waiting for this moment for generation upon generation. And the angels proclaim the thing you've been waiting for. It's just happened. There's an old woman. Her name's Anna. Uh, this is what uh, Luke says about her. Verse 36. There was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher, she was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin and then as a widow until she was 84. She didn't depart from the temple, worshipping with fasting and prayer night and day. <clears throat> and coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And so God, through messenger, like angelic messengers, tells people um, through... This prophetess who had been serving God for decade upon decade, known for somebody who speaks the things of the Lord, starts saying, oh, wait a second, something has changed. This thing we've been waiting for, it's finally happened. And what do we see from every person who experiences, if we could call it like, if we could say it like this, who experiences Christmas for the first time, <clears throat> in the first moments, as it's happening, the long-awaited Saviour has come. The one thing that they all have in common is they can't keep it in. It's like, the, it's like the joy that was promised to them has already bubbled up in them and it's spilling out out of them. Anyone they come up against, anyone that they bump into, anyone that they see, they're proclaiming. It's happened. It's here. He has come for us. He's here. 
and whatever other circumstances are happening in their life. For this, this woman, whose husband died when she was young, lives a widow for decades to be filled with joy and proclaiming, it's happened, he's here. The Old Testament is filled with people looking forward to God's redemption, living through incredibly difficult times of suffering and famine and persecution and really good times and then suffering and captivity and death. And all the while, they have this promise from God where he says, I'm going to come and undo everything that is wrong. I'm going to redeem my people to myself. Make everything new again. And over and over and over throughout the Old Testament, throughout the story of the people of God, we see pictures and signs and types of the one who was to come. We hear from prophets promises of the one who is to come. We see foreshadowing of the one who is to come and we hear just directly from God. I'm coming. I'm going to save you. And he's finally here. And as I think about <clears throat> how we as a culture experience joy, I'm really not sure we have anything to compare it with and that's kind of the point. But if you think about even the most phenomenal moment of your life, like I could think of maybe uh, like a, in a moment at least, like a, a snapshot of your life where maybe you're in a grand final but you're a massive underdog and then you, you overcome the opposition and you win the grand final. And you're like, yeah, in that moment. You know, you've seen people, fan, even fans of people, not even on the field, in the grandstands when their team wins and hands high and heart abandoned. Uh, yeah, we did it, we did it. Well, your team did it, but still, you know. Or maybe, um, like in our life at least, we, we, uh, for Beck and I, we, uh, when we were first married, we tried to have kids for a number of years and kids were eluding us. Or, or at least, you know, getting pregnant didn't seem to be a problem, but staying pregnant was a very big problem. So we had this hope, not a promise, like we have a Jesus. We had a hope. And then when our first kid came, it was like, it was both relief and excitement and joy. So I think that could be a little bit of the, you know, a little bit of a thing. Or maybe you've had a, a like a diagnosis that was uh, really heartbreaking, and then through medical ent intervention or providential hand of God, you've had healing. And again, that it's both relief and excitement and. And joy, these are the kinds of things I can, you know, again, I find it difficult to try to, to try to think of something that we would experience. I know certainly, and we've got people even among our community here who have escaped <clears throat> uh, literal war zones where, where they face certain death and through circumstance and again, the providence of God and after years have made it and either become citizens or, you know, have safety. And again, that, it's relief and it's excitement and it's a, oh my goodness, I didn't know, I don't have confidence in the future, but now, for the very first time, I have confidence in the future. I think these are the kinds of things that these people are happening. And so when we talk about Christmas and it becomes cute, like, you know, away in a manger, a crib for a bed, little Lord Jesus, you know, sleep in his bed. I, I can't even remember the words. <laughs> Just make it up. You know, uh, the cattle are lowing, the baby awakes. It, it's kind of cute and, and easy and sanitized. And when we look at that and that's our Christmas, no wonder our view kind of shifts over here to family and fun and food and presence and, you know, good weather and experience and whatnot. Because that's it's not really the Christmas as promised by these angels, these messengers, being good news of great joy. We miss the actual joy of Christmas when we see cute little baby Jesus in a manger. 
without the context of, here lies the one who breathes and galaxies appear in obedience to his voice. And he came because we were lost. We were subject to our sin and our rebellion. We were headed for destruction. But this baby is the God of the universe who has become like us in order to live the life we couldn't live, in order to associate with us broken, sinful, lost and blind creatures. Not to leave us to our own devices or in our own path to destruction, but to redeem us and save us, call us to himself, to make us sons and daughters of God the Father. This is good news of great joy that totally trumps all other joys. I'm not saying don't have plan for really good food or really you know, great family or buy really great gifts. The reason we give gifts and the reason we should, or let me say could, be the people who give the greatest of gifts is because we have received the greatest of gifts. It's not that we have this pressure from our culture to get the gift that our person or people want or try to live up to some expectation. It is an overflow of the joy we have from receiving the greatest gift of all. When we get together as family, it's not to fulfill some sort of expectation, it's to share with the people we love the most this greatest of joy. Do you see what I mean? So when we come to Christmas, we're not coming to Christmas to get or to be fulfilled or to uh, get our satisfaction from food, family, friends, gifts, weather. We come to Christmas to give of the overflow of the joy that we have from the greatest gift of all, who is Jesus. And that means we're not coming to those things to get something that they cannot possibly give us in any sustaining way. So we come to them, we can enjoy them for what they are because we're not placing unrealistic expectations upon them. We come totally filled. We come totally joyed. Joyed? Joyed? Yeah, totally joyed. So we don't want to become too familiar with this story of, you know, baby in a manger. I forget who Jesus is, why he came, but rather we want to sing, like we just sang, joyful all you nations rise. Join the triumph of the skies. This is what the shepherds did. They rose up, they joined the triumph of the skies. When they go and they tell Mary, Mary's already been promised these things and she's treasuring up, up in her heart and going, it, it's, it's really happening right now. And she glorifies God. She joins the triumph of the skies. The Bible is full of joy. When Jesus uh, says in John 15, he says, I've told you all this stuff. This is my paraphrase. I told you all these things so that my joy would be in you and your joy would be full or complete, lacking nothing, total. So you're walking around as a joy-filled person, not expecting other things to fulfill or to satisfy you because you're already satisfied. You are already joyed, which means you can bring satisfaction to every relationship and every circumstance. You can bring joy to every relationship and every circumstance. Or 1 John, uh, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you. Again, just like the shepherds did, just like Mary did, just like the angels did. So that you too may have fellowship with us, fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we're writing these things to you so that your joy, sorry, he says, so that our joy may be complete. So saying, what is the thing that was lacking in our joy? It's the proclamation of our joy. C.S. Lewis alludes to this. I forget his exact quote, so let me give you another paraphrase. Where he says that your joy is not complete until you share your joy. This is why the fans on the sidelines scream, yeah! Because if they, if, can you imagine the scenes of an AFL grand final, 100,000 fans, 50,000 of them elated, sitting there with their hands folded? We did it. 
Good match, everybody. See you pre-season. But rather, our joy is made complete in the sharing of our joy, in the proclamation of our joy, in the living as joyed ones, in the showing that our joy doesn't come from our temporal or material circumstances. Our joy comes because Jesus came for us. That's where our joy comes from. Nehemiah 8, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Not my physical condition, not even my mental condition. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I want you to have a great physical and a great mental condition. The foundation of our strength is our joy in the Lord. Even when our body fails us, or even when our mind fails us, the joy of the Lord does not fail us. It doesn't change. Job 8, he will yet fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouts of joy, even in the midst of suffering, even when you're in the midst of grief, even when all of those things that I was talking about before, that our culture says this is where you would derive your joy at Christmas, even when all of those things fail you, I'm not saying don't grieve. I'm not saying we just push all those things down because well, it doesn't matter because the joy is here. I'm saying even at the same time, you can grieve and have joy to the full. At the same time. When we grieve, Christians should be the ones that grieve the best. We can grieve full. We don't have to pretend it doesn't hurt. We don't have to put on a brave face. We can say, hey, actually, Christmas is going to be difficult this year because my family... Life sucks at the moment. Or I just lost my job. Or I don't know if I'm going to see another Christmas. And at the same time, have joy to the full because of what Jesus, who Jesus is and what he's done for us. Rejoice in the Lord always, Philippians 4. And again, I say it, rejoice always. Romans 15, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abandon hope. So the joy actually leads to a hope again. That joy that helps us to see there is a future. There is a tomorrow because of the joy we have, because Jesus came for us, because he didn't leave us. Now when the angels come, we're, we're talking about uh, messengers from God, right? The, the, the first thing they say is, don't be afraid. The implication being their very presence would be not just awe-inspiring, but maybe dread-inspiring. I said, don't be afraid. God has come among you. The Lord has come among you. If God had come to them as a conquering king among enemies, they would have had great reason to be afraid. Oh, there's, there's nothing you can do against this enemy. You've rebelled against the holy God and he's come for you. That would be terrifying news. But they say, don't be afraid. This is good news. Great joy. He's come for you. To redeem you. To save you. To make you a people. To dwell with you. To forgive you. To not count any of your sins against you, not count your rebellion against you, to make you perfect like he's perfect, blameless, spotless, righteous. That scripture says to take you out of the kingdom of darkness, bring you into the kingdom of light, into his own family. That's what we're celebrating at Christmas. He's come for you because he loves you, not because... He wants you to remain his enemies as a conquering king but because you're his enemies and he doesn't want you to be his enemies anymore. He wants to be his family, his friends, his loved ones and even his bride. Joy is all over scripture and it points to Jesus. It points to Jesus in the Old Testament, highlights Jesus in the Gospels points back to Jesus throughout the rest of the New Testament because he is the source of our joy. He is our joy. 
This is again what we are celebrating at Christmas. Joy has come. He's here. The joy giver, the joy bringer, the source and object of our joy. Let's not lose our joy by hanging our joy on lesser things. We've got to do work to do this because everything, including our flesh, will say, hang it on these other things. And when those things disappoint, it's terrible and we're crushed unless we hang our joy on the person and work of Jesus who never fails, who has already defeated sin and death. He's already overcome the grave. He has already made you pure, spotless, blameless in your union with him. This is like, this is the most joy-bringing, joy-giving news we could possibly have. And to the degree that we remember and sit in, who is Jesus and who is Jesus to us? We will have joy and joy to the full and our joy will be complete as we share that joy with others. You have access to this joy today, every day. A joy that doesn't diminish with your circumstance. A joy that can coexist with grief and loss. Malachi, two, Malachi 4, verse 2 says, you, For you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise up with healing in its wings. And you will go out and playfully jump like calves from the stall. This is where Hark the Herald Angels gets its, you know, the sun of righteousness risen with healing in his wings, borrowing from Malachi. And what's the response to Christmas? It's in the, in the morning. We were in the darkness, but now we're in the light. And we'll go out like baby calves and jump for joy. That's the picture of a Christian at Christmas. We, we are little calves, playful, joyful, jumping from the stall. The night is gone, the day is here. The brokenness has been dealt with and healing has come with the sun. And we are like little calves, lo loving life because we are doing life with Jesus because he's saved us, given us a new hope and new tomorrow. So this, here's, my, here's my call for this Christmas. Uh, let us be the ones who show everybody in our world the better way. When we gather, let's gather and have wonderful family gatherings. So absolutely, let's do all those things and do them awesomely. And all the while, we come to them full of joy, not demanding they do something in us or for us that they can never fully do. Let's not come to our family expecting fulfillment. Let's come to our family being fulfilled in Christ and giving them joy. And, and hopefully, likewise, they're doing the same and it'll just be joy overflowing on the joy. As we come to our gifts, you don't get the one that you were hoping for, but that's okay because you can be both disappointed and full of joy. The roast doesn't work out the way you want it to. That's okay. You can be disappointed and full of joy. Or if the roast does come out the way you want it to and it's amazing, then praise God and be full of joy. Does this make sense? Try to abstract your joy from these things that we lay all of our expectation upon and to put it on the person who work at Jesus who will always and can only satisfy, who will always and can only bring you the joy to the full and joy of lasting. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for these wonderful promises we have in Jesus. In him, all of your promises are yes, so let it be. Because you are the wonderful God who loves us, who had compassion on us. Like sheep without a shepherd, you became our shepherd. You have led us to those green pastures. You've acted upon us, not according to our works, but according to Christ's own righteousness. You are so, so very good to us. We love and we thank you. As we're looking at Christmas, uh, which is a, I mean, you know, like a big cultural event, 
Um, help us, please, Lord, to cut through all of that, enjoying all of that, but hanging our hope on you, anchoring our joy in Jesus, who he is, what he's done. Help us to be like Jesus. Help us to be joy bringers and joy givers at Christmas. In particular, for those who don't know you, Lord, help us to love them really well and proclaim this joy we have really well in a way that helps them understand they too are welcome in your family, that you love them, you are calling them to yourself even through us. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. So today, we're going to gather around the table. We're going to remember Jesus. Remember what he came to do. He came to identify with us. He came to become one of us uh, in order to make a people for himself. And in his flesh, in his body, he bore the weight of our sin. He took the penalty of our sin. That's why we uh, have bread in obedience to Jesus where he said, this is my bread, take it and eat it in remembrance of me. And the cup, we remember Jesus' blood was poured out and spilled, covers over all of our sin, every stain, all shame is gone because his blood poured out for us. He, he, man, he loves us so much. He's so wonderful. If you're in Christ today, you're welcome to come join around the table. Remember what he's done. Uh, if you're here today, you're not a Christian. I just want to first say how welcome you are here. We love having you here. Um, Secondly, I want to say we're not Christians because we're really awesome or we're really smart or we figured out cosmic loopholes to make God love us, but only because, uh, like I am proclaiming this joy to you, someone proclaimed this joy to us. And God is inviting you as well into His family today. You don't have to go get your life in order. You don't have to like achieve, like a, a, you don't have to like tick off a checklist of things to try to make Him love you. He loves you already. That's why He sent His Son for you. That's why He came for you. That's why we celebrate Christmas. Uh, what you do is you respond to his invitation by stopping trying to live life your own way, trying to reach up to him with your goodness and saying, I just receive the gift that Jesus has for me, your love, your mercy. That what he's done on the cross is all that's needed, totally sufficient. And that's it. That's what the Bible talks about, repenting and believing, repenting, turning from your old ways and believing that what he's done is all that's necessary. And so I just encourage you to ask the person who brought you along or someone sitting next to you, say, how, can you help me understand how I can respond to Jesus, how I can live in the freedom and love of God? And I'd love to pray with you and help you understand that. Or come speak with me afterwards, I'd love to do that as well. Uh, for everyone else, let's come gather on the table, respond to Jesus' love and invitation, and we're going to respond and reply with doing what we just saw, responding, proclaiming about the love that we have so that our joy might be complete. Let's do it.